Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and another week. And we are off to Anzio. 80 years ago today, the landings in Anzio began, Operation Shingle. And joining us today to talk about the campaign and probably more importantly, the individuals who are part of it is Alex Kershaw. Alex has penned several books that cover the fighting in Italy. And we are delighted to have him back on the channel. Um, good afternoon, Alex. How are you today? I'm great, thanks, mate. How are you? I'm really good. So, we were just chatting before going live there about the Italian campaign generally and, and whether or not perhaps it's more difficult to write about than other campaigns because you have these series of different landings, different places and units start in one place and move somewhere else. Is it is it a complicated one, do you think, to get into? Uh, I don't know. I mean, it depends. Um, I think you can make it as complicated as you want. Um, it's certainly a very frustrating yeah, look at that. I mean, there's lines everywhere. Uh, looks like someone's dropped a pile of spaghetti on the map there, yeah. Yeah, it looks like Mark Clark's worst nightmare, which it was. Um, you know, I, I don't know. It's a good. It's a really good question. Um, I think um, if you look at the campaign as a whole, um, it's a, a very frustrating narrative. You know, it was way more frustrating for the people who had to fight in Italy, but it, it, is, a, it is quite complicated because we... You know, you, you're not going very far, and there's an awful lot of awful lot going on. A lot of, if you look at that map, for example, you know, as the Allies pushed up from the, um, the south of Italy, um, itself being an extraordinary challenge. I think it was Napoleon who said that you know you never invade Italy from the heel of the boot, um, and I think I don't think it had been ever been done successfully. Um, so as you go up Italy, the most the most important thing to say first of all is that it's you know on that map you can't see the mountains, yeah. so it was just one you know Ernie Pyle um, I think said it was a land of mount mountains, mules and mud, um, and it was literally if you go to Italy and I've been to many of the places that you can see on the map there I was back there in just uh, in October um, it's one four or five thousand foot mountain after another pretty much all the way up to the Alps. Uh, um, so I think the terrain is ex explains a lot about the Italian yeah. campaign. And uh, once you get, once you understand that, then you can kind of get into the nitty gritty. Um, I think broader without banging on too much. I think when people come and look at the Italian campaign, they have to understand that we had a, ma a massive problem, which is, and that's why, you know, people trying to exonerate Mark Clark or bang on about how you know he disobeyed orders going to Rome etc um one thing that is not said enough in Mark Clark's defense and I'm not a defender at all is that he was given a really bad job this is a bad yeah. deal you know you're looking at two theater war for the Yanks anyway Pacific theater Asia Pacific theater and the European theater they got to finish off Hitler first and then take out Tojo. It boils down to how many landing craft did you got? This is a, this is a, a world war of amphibious invasions. How many landing craft did you got? And how many men can you put in those landing craft that can actually fight or want to fight, will return fire in a firefight, et cetera? And the answer is to both those questions, not enough. Yeah. Um, and so Italy is the classic, classic example of not landing enough men, enough divisions, um, not building up a, a, a broad enough and um, strong enough bridgehead. That's the story of the Italian campaign in terms of the amphibious invasions, which is Salerno, September 1943, and then the attempted end run, as the Yanks called it, at Anzio, which is 80 years today. Just didn't have enough men. Both times we didn't land enough men and we didn't have enough aggression and uh, weren't well enough led, I think, and you could make you could make the argument, although that sounds like Monday morning quarterbacking, but I think you can understand a lot more about the Italian campaign if you realize that we literally fought that campaign with, you know, one hand tied behind our back. Um, Anzio initially, you know, the crazy thing about Anzio, I didn't realize this, was that, you know, initially they were only going to land one, one division, the third U.S. infantry division there, plus a few attached uh, other units. But um, Truscott, who's the third division commander, who actually, you know, ends up, People would say saving the day at Anzio from the American point of view, um, who replaces Lucas. Um, you know, Truscott was the third division commander and uh, he'd led the third division, as you can see on that map, from, you know, 
North Africa, Sicily, um, Salerno, up through uh, Italy, and then, you know, was in Naples uh, yesterday, um, seeing his boys from the third division um, board ships for the Anzio invasion. Mm. And uh, he told Mark Clark in no uncertain terms, I, I'm not going to, I can't paraphrase it exactly, but, you know, you're going to destroy my entire division. And I care a lot about my division. It's already been decimated in, uh, in you know, o October, November 1943 had already been ripped apart, ripped to shreds in mountain fighting um, in some, you know, just north of Italy, just the north of Naples. And now you're sending my battered division full of replacements, my only my division, on a very risky amphibious landing, and you're expecting us to get to Rome. This is crazy. You know, this is madness. So I think if you look at certainly the Anzio campaign in the context of the fact that from the very start, it was, you know, doomed, um, you could say doomed to failure, um, led by, a, you know, a, a very reticent, afraid, Lucas pipe smoking old bloke that didn't have any real confidence. And Mark Clark had actually told, Fifth Army Commander Mark Clark had told Lucas, you know, Johnny, don't stick your neck out. Mm. I stuck my neck out at Salerno and uh, worse this effect nearly had it chopped off because Mark Clark nearly did. People forget that at Salerno, we were like two or three hours from complete failure. Yeah. yeah. Um, really, really close shave there. Um, I would say that the 45th Infantry Division, the Thunderbirds saved the day. You know, um, the fact that we sh fired 10 times more for every German shell fired in the European theater in World War II, the Americans fired 10 times as many. Um, you know, artillery fire and the sheer guts and determination of one division for two or three hours, 13th of September 1943, keeps us in the Mediterranean campaign, or rather the Italian, what became the Italian campaign. Um, we were so close to failure. Um, and, um, you know, Anzio, it was a crazy plan. It was rushed. It was um, basically, you know, the terrible thing about the Anzio campaign is that you have really ridiculously low casualties. I think less than 20 Americans killed on today, 80 years ago, and then you <laughs> with over 40,000 Allied casualties, four month stalemate. Um, many people, many some of the veterans I interviewed, and I think quite a few historians would argue that if you want to look at the most intense combat that continued for, you know, as I said, almost four months, some of the most intense combat of World War II, it was at Anzio. Um, and Germans would agree. The, you know, German veterans said that, you know, it was worse than Stalingrad. And I'm like, oh, come on, you know, that's like, that can't be true. But if you look at the map, that's a great, it's great that you put it there. Um, I asked Flint Whitlock, I don't know whether you've had Flint on your show. You maybe I haven't, have. no, but I have corresponded yeah. with him. Yeah, he's, um, he's, he's, he's great. Um, and I was talking to him on Saturday and I asked him this question. I'm like, why, why are all these veterans telling, uh, you know, so haunted by Anzio? Why was it such a bloodbath? Why was it so traumatizing? And he said, well, it's because it was, there was nowhere to hide. You know, the Germans controlled the high ground. We were like a beached whale, as Churchill said, stuck on the Anzio plane. And the only, only place that you could, you had a chance of not being, not being killed by a shell, and that included nurses, whoever, was deep underground. Mm. Um, and so it's a confined space. Um, you know, we're trapped basically in this hell hell hole, um, and the Germans are firing down on us. They know exactly where we are. They can spot all our movements, um, and they are under orders from Hitler to lance the abscess south of Rome, as Hitler put it, um, because Hitler knows if he could. This is a this is a great opportunity to really kick the Allies in the ass, so to speak, and yeah. uh, it was feasible, and they came close. Um, so, um, Anzio is not a, it's not a happy story. Um, the, it's, I would say the entire Italian campaign is not one that you know veterans, the few veterans alive today, look back on and think you know um, there's a lot of frustration. A lot of I, I've met veterans that were very bitter about the Italian campaign, thought it was Churchill's debacle you know something that was the soft underbelly of europe as mark clark said it turned out to be a tough old gut indeed um anyway i think maybe that answers your question you know it, it does and and i want to talk now about the 45th and the third because you've written about yeah. both those divisions in you know the liberator and and against all odds and 
the other thing about the Anzio learning is no one's starting exactly fresh. They've either been in the meat grinder, as you said yourself, for months, if not years before that. Uh, uh, yeah. The turnaround from their previous engagements, they were pulled out from one line straight into another one. So it's not like it's not like Normandy, where most of those units have had months, if not years, to hone to a, to a fine edge to take that landing on. This is this is men who are already. Um, beaten. They're not beat, not beaten in the sense of it, it, victory and loss. Beaten in terms of physically on on their, you know, they're they're on their knees to some extent. They've been in combat. It's been grueling. They've seen lots of their buddies killed. The replacements are coming through, but they're trying to bed them in. So, of those two divisions, how would you describe? Are they similar going into this in the in the state of their morale? Would you think there's a difference between the forty fifth and the third? You know, in sort of January forty four. Um. Well, I think it's um. It's somewhat ironic that we end up talking about the third and the forty-fifth because those, you know, those two divisions were actually superb outfits. Um, yeah. You know, the third division uh, spent longest in combat in the European theatre, um, and I think the forty-fifth uh, came second. So you're talking about two units that that were third is involved in five amphibious invasions. Um, mm -hmm. Third arrives in North Africa in November 1942. And Anzio is the first, second, third, the fourth amphibious invasion for them, for the third ID. So they 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 know how to get at a landing craft, and they're superbly well led by Truscott. I think is one of the finest division commanders of. Agreed. Forty um, fifth was superbly led. Um, for the forty fifth, this is their third amphibious invasion. Um, so I think it's it's difficult because they're both fantastic units. Um, you know, third ID lost more men than any other American division in World War II, uh, basically because it was it had more opportunities to do so. It's the most decorated division. So, you know, I'll give you one example. Um, 101st Airborne, glamour boys that, you know, finished off Hitler in Europe and then were, you know, single-handedly won the war. Um, two medal, two medals of honor, as you know. Yep. Um, I think they're a day apart in Market Garden. Um, two um from that division it's like, i think 117 days on the line um actually engaged in combat and then the third id um is uh, 40 medal of honor recipients so what's crazy is that of the somewhat of you know around about 90 division us divisions in the european theater by the end of the war the third id um accounts for a tenth of all around about a tenth of all the medals of honor received yeah. by all Americans in World War II, and that's the Pacific and the European theater. So it's, it's when you really think about that, a tenth from one division, um, and uh, that's basically because of the intensity of the combat they were in, and the, again, the opportunities they had to earn medals for valor. So what I'm saying is that the 45th and the third were, were fantastic units, and thank goodness they were, because they were up against it at Anzio. Uh, really up against it. And I think that veterans from both divisions, um, looking back, uh, you know, many of them after the war said that Anzio was the toughest fighting. Um, mm -hmm. Clearly that was the case with a bunch of guys that I interviewed from the 157th, which is the Liberators uh, Regiment from the 45th. And they were really up against it. And uh, they, uh, most of the guys that I interviewed at, at reunion said that Anzio was was hell. It was like it was the toughest, you know, because it was unrelenting. You know, you couldn't if you were lucky enough to get back from the front lines um, to some kind of place where you could uh, rest and recuperate. You were still under fire, so there was there was not a moment went by when you weren't. You know, your life could uh, was was not on the line. So I think it was. Yeah accumulation of stress the conditions the weather the you know the, the constant knowledge that you, you could be killed at any moment that that really eroded the nerves um you ended up i think the british called it the anzio the anzio uh crouch or the anzio stoop and you know that was uh, a case where guys had been there for quite a while you know they when you when you walked around you didn't walk you, you crouched down as low as you could to the ground because you knew that at any moment a shell might explode so um ernie Pyle, you know almost had a nervous breakdown there he, he was there almost to the end of the battle um you know he was at the harbor and under nearly killed i think a shell hit the building where the press corps were um 
and he and he had he had he had the nerves pretty bad and a lot of people did um it's mm. just, you know this is a um it's like the f conditions like the first world war you know you're you're dug in in what is and you know trying to keep your head below a, a trench um it's a static pretty much static lines sometimes they move sometimes they don't there are count very fierce counterattacks launched by the germans operation fishfang being one of them on the 16th of february 1944 um, and it's just a slugfest. It's attrition uh, and four months of stalemate, really, before we finally break out. So um, a horrible experience if you manage yeah. to get well, through. Well that, well, that map I've got on screen now, that is kind of the first day of this German counterattack. And, you know, and all those red arrows there, folks, all pushing downwards and across from the right, that's that's the sort of German advances. And, and you know, it's against the British, it's against American, it's against American, American and Canadian Special Forces, the Rangers involved. We're talking about them later in the week. And... I think, you know, we don't want to go too much into kind of the operational art and the planning, yeah. but this German counterattack was arguably greater than the Allies were expecting. It, kind of, it didn't come out of nowhere as such, but it was it was, it was, was formidable. The Germans were were demonstrating almost echoes of how they'd been three years ago. This is against the run of play. After Sicily, maybe there's a feeling amongst the Allies that the Germans are kind of broken now. We're just going to push them back, keep on applying this immense pressure, and they'll crumble. But... Anzio is is the opposite of that. The Germans really put up. You said it yourself. A real, real staunch, aggressive uh, a counterattack. So, how did that affect you know from either the third divisions or the forty fifth divisions point of view? Do you think these guys were expecting the ferocity of the German counterattacks? Um, well, I think that um, combat veterans from uh, you know Sicily and um, the push up the. Spine of Italy knew exactly what the Germans could do, which was they could, you know, kill an awful lot of troops very quickly. They were very, very, very good in combat. And uh, we have to remember that Kesselring, the overall German commander of um, operation in, you know, the Italian campaign for, for much of it, um, was a master of defensive war um, and uh, was very effective indeed. So I think, you know, Anzio is memorable for, we should point out that, you know, there, these are, this is like the Eastern Front. This is, you know, yeah. Germans, you know, hundreds and hundreds of Germans coming out one position, just just going over the top, so to speak, and, and coming at you, you know, waves of humans coming at you and you having to mow them down or be mowed down. So this is really, you know, up close and, and personal and uh, old style World War One Eastern Front style mm. savage combat. Um, the thing to notice about this map that it's, it's kind of like important is that, um, if you go from Rome to Anzio, it takes about, I guess, about an hour if you've got decent traffic today. So it's not very far. And, you know, many people point out that we, we we could have hit Rome within the first 48 hours easily if we wanted to, whether we would then have been, you know, whether it then would have been a salient that it would have been destroyed. I think we would have been destroyed. So that wouldn't have been a good idea. But the road, the main road from Anzio to to Rome is the Via Anziate, and that if you look on the map, you go that's the road that's heading north from Anzio Natuno. You go through the Padiglione woods, they were completely shredded by artillery fire, uh, and then you head towards the heights. and You can see the 157th there, marked there. That's Felix Sparks's battalion, uh, regiment rather. The, the, my book, the this one, The Liberator, is about him. Um, and then you you can see the various units from the 45th. You've got the 175th, the 180th, and the British over to the over to the um, to the west. Um, so that road was the key to success at Anzio. And you, you, I know you're going to talk about the Rangers later on, the tragedy of Derby's Rangers, which is a yeah. true tragedy, and an incredible story. And the British at Anzio, wow, incredible! Just the levels of attrition, the the units that were 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 turned over. Um, but the key really to understanding uh, success or failure at Anzio, um, for the Germans certainly, is whether you can take that road. That is the main highway to victory. And you've got to control that road for all sorts of reasons. And it's down that road the Germans pushed um, you know, several times, notably on the 3rd of February, an intense counter attack. And uh, most uh, notably for me, and I think in, in terms of the, the overall battle, uh, the fiercest attempt to push down the Via Anzietti and kick the Allies into the uh, into the sea came during Operation Fishhook, Fishbang, 
uh, which is the 16th of February. So that's the third, you know, succeeds to a certain extent, allies pull back a little bit. Um, and then you've got Fishbang on the 16th, where they really, really slam uh, slam the allies. Because they, you know, Kesselring's intelligence um, was that, you know, we were under a lot of pressure. Um, the morale is low um, in many units. And, you know, this is a great, a wonderful opportunity to, to achieve a, a notable victory in the European theatre. Um, so, yeah, very, very intense fighting. Um, I think they, you know, we could talk about Sparks' unit, um, the 157th, um, during the late latter part of February. You know, he's an, a company commander, E Company 157th, Captain Felix Sparks. And uh, at the beginning of Operation Fishfang, his very, his unit, if you go back to that map, the Via Anziate, right at the, the where. I think I've got one of the exact. Yeah. Uh, so he's a, he's unfortunate. Yeah. It's very unfortunate that his unit, E Company, has been placed either side, right at the point of the, um, uh, right to either side of the Via Anziate. So when, in the early hours of the 16th of February, 1944, when the Germans launch what is their most, in, you know, their most concerted counterattack, Fischbank, they hit him first, because he's his unit, E Company, are either side of the Via Anziate. And if you you know watch the Liberator on Netflix or you read my book, or whatever, I mean, it's just like you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Germans in wave after wave coming at him, um, his position to either side of that road. And uh, I think you know 16th of February, I, he never had a full company. Um, there's, ne there's never more than 150 guys available to him at any one time as a company commander because you've got attrition and wo wounded, killed, etc. Um, but uh, by the time he finally breaks out from what becomes known as the Battle of the Cave, so he's at the, the Germans attack on the 16th. Um, he's holding the Via Anziati, so he's literally at the most vital point, the, the, the really the most important point of the German counter attack on the 16th. Um, his unit takes massive casualties. He pulls back um, several miles to a place called the Caves. There are a series of man-made caves. Yeah. Uh, just I think it's just to the east of the Via Anziate, and then they're surrounded by the Germans. Um, thankfully, the Thunderbirds, you know, they absorb an enormous amount of casualties. Uh, his uh, one battalion, uh, it's over three quarters casualties, but they hold their positions and stop that counterattack. But meanwhile, E Company have been completely surrounded. Sparks' uh, company have been completely surrounded. The 157th Infantry Regiment, terrible, uh, casualties, lots of guys taken prisoner, and uh, for two weeks almost at the, at the caves um, beside the Via Anziate, um, Sparks's unit fight and try and hold out in this series of man-made caves. And finally, he gets—I think it's the um, after ten days—he gets orders to try and break out with whoever's still alive, still can still try and break back to Allied lines. And so, imagine this—you know—is E Company commander, he gets he manages to get back, I think, with about a dozen guys. But he's the only guy, apart from a, a supply sergeant called Leon Sear, from his entire company who gets back to Allied lines. It's British lines. You know, mm. it, was, it wasn't even American lines. So you're a company commander and you've lost every single guy, wounded, killed, or captured in the space of li literally two weeks. That's an example of just the intensity and ferocity of of the combat at Anzio and the very high losses that we sustained um, trying to stop the Germans push us back into the sea. Mm. And then, thank you for that. And in your research with Felix Sparks and the other guys in that unit, you know, we, we had you on before talking about the fighting in Germany later on. And, you know, with, with a unit that did so many extraordinary things, with the veterans and the accounts you read, you said earlier that this rates as one of the most miserable experiences, you know, like a Stalingrad, very lots of bitterness. Um, was this their their finest moment as a unit, or did it? Would you think? I mean, was there are there too many fine moments to kind of pin it on one particular uh, campaign? Well, I mean, I think this would be you know um, this is when they were most severely tested. I'd say that definitely. Mm. Um, um, you know, they went through Sicily. They had their moments there. Um, you know, when the Germans decided to fight, they they could inflict very high casualties and. Uh, 
I, I, do, I do i do agree to some extent with the kind of hastings um theory which is that you know when the odds are even if you take away the artillery the air air support etc and you you put the verb act up against a, a british or american division or canadian that you know it was it was a dodgy that's a dodgy deal indeed that the germans were superbly um superbly led and and, and very very good at, at kicking our backsides <laughs> um you know one of the thing that the thing that saved the day at, at, at salerno and the thing that really saved the day at Anzio for us was artillery. You know, yeah. we just pounded the hell out of them. We had way more. They had a lot of artillery, but we had even more. Thank goodness. Um, thanks to the American housewife. Um, no, Rose. definitely. And and that's what the thing about when I, if I put that map up again of the of the front line is that um, it, because of the, the the hills and the valleys that you talked about earlier, it's not like. This isn't the line of troops, right? Like I used to line my matchbox figures up on my yeah. dining room table as a kid, where I have the Brits on the left and then the, then the Americans yeah. and the Aussies. That, that is sort of how it is on a map. But each battle is almost in its so its own arena because of the valleys and 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 the yeah. and the hills you talked about. So I would imagine it would feel kind of isolated. You know, veterans who fought in this campaign wouldn't necessarily have felt they were part of this long blue line we can see in the map there when you've got germans coming at you through a valley or over over a bridge towards you with the amount of armor they're pouring in and you know we can go into another subject another day about as you said there's lots of armor a lot of artillery but we're a bit lacking in armor because of the spreading out of our tank battalion things like that so it, it's it's sort of deceptive that battle in the, in that map in that it, it's not showing these kind of isolated not kind of Alamo stands, but isolated kind of regimental, even battalion actions that are going on in the, at this time. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good point, uh, Paul, because I think that, you know, most most people watching um, your amazing show um, do know that um, the experience of a infantryman, um, wherever it was in World War II, they, they had no idea what was going on, you know, from most of yeah. them 100 yards away, you know, a mile away they didn't certainly didn't have that, that in front of them as they were sitting there being shelled they didn't have a, a broader strategic picture of, of anything often beyond their squad or their platoon or even their company you know um but going back to your point about how the map doesn't really reveal the, the landscape and the difficulty of the terrain um this this is so-called plain of anzio but there are lots of what were called what is drainage big you know deep drainage ditches that could be 20 30 feet um in depth that had been placed there under Mussolini in the 30s to try and drain a lot of this area, which was marshland um, as part of Mussolini's new New Italy. Um, and so a lot of the fighting, certainly, the, you know, famously for the British, occurred in the wadis, the, the famous yeah. wadis, um, which did allow some protection. They were like, you know, man-made Mussolini trenches for you. Um, so, you know, um, but I, I think going back to the, the point about artillery fire and how it really saved the day so many times in the European theater, so many times, I think it'd be really great for you to do, maybe get some, some guys together or, and maybe there's a few women that know about this too, but anyway, and talk about what was the single most important factor for allied ground troops in terms of defeating the Germans on the Western front. And I would say that, you know, air, air support, obviously, but, Let's talk about the importance of, of artillery. I think you could do a whole, I mean, it, it, you can't, under, I don't think you can underestimate just how critical it was. Uh, certainly the way that when you look at German testimonies from b battles such as Anzio and elsewhere, certainly Normandy, that it's, you know, the artillery is, it plays a huge role. Um, and, you know, they, they disdained us, you know, uh, you know, you guys don't fight fair, you know, you don't, you don't, you know, you should man up and, 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 and face off properly. You, they, the great, the, the common criticism about Amer the Americans was that they just shelled the hell out of yeah. uh, the Germans and then, you know, tentatively crept towards them and then would stop and shell them again and didn't, didn't want to get up close and personal. And, uh, you know, I, it was a, it was an effective strategy, you know? Yeah. Uh, Robin they, Pryor made that point on one of our yeah. myth shows a couple of weeks ago about this yeah. idea that man for man, the German soldier was better than the Allied soldier. His point is, I don't care. You know, we yeah, didn't yeah. do that. We, we went in with... Yeah. Why not use this industrial might we had? Why not use thousands of yeah. artillery pieces and thousands of it? We don't have yeah, to if go we have in to, final if we, have to, if we have to bomb every city to, to, to pieces and drop, on a, drop two nuclear bombs on the Japanese, so what? 
you know, you started it. Yeah. Uh, and what, you know, I'm watching the, I know that sounds clear, but I'm watching the world at war at the moment. Um, you know, I'm on the second of 26 episodes and it's just like, I, I know it's just absolutely fantastic. And um, one of the things that you realize is just like, okay, these guys, the Germans, you know, were preparing from 1933. Uh that's a long time while you know we were you know we were basically you know chamberlain in 19 early 1940 is still hoping that hitler's going to be knocked off by someone you know the, yeah. where where the british are completely haunted and the french but we're haunted by passchendaele the somme yeah. they're just like this extraordinary bloodletting and then we're you know we're having to put boys on boats and do it all over again and uh Germans were not haunted by that. If they were haunted by the World War One, it was by by the by uh, a sense of humiliation and 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 lust for vengeance. Uh, mm. But um, going back to my broader point, if the artillery with the with the Liberator and E Company, you see the map there with the one fifty seven. When they became surrounded during Operation Fishfang by the Germans, Sparks did what he called pulling the chain. So it's like pulling the toilet chain, you know, flushing flushing himself. <laughs> down the bog so to speak only a limey could come up with that but anyway um that meant that he called the 158th artillery uh he called he called in fire from his own supporting artillery unit onto his own positions because that's how intense the combat was he had to actually shell his own position to stop the germans from getting inside yeah. his caves so you know and it worked it, you know if you look at photographs that i've got in the book it's like you know, they shelled the hell out of the Germans all around them and stopped them. It stopped them. Um, and I think the Battle of Anzio is about the Germans throwing everything they could and us shelling the hell out of them and stopping them. Uh, yeah, and, and the, yeah. With, our, with our historian hats, we can kind of see that the Germans can't maintain this kind of tempo no. No. like the Allies can. No. But I wouldn't dare say that to a guy who was in E-Company on that line. Said, Don't worry, mate. The Germans can't maintain this tempo yeah, very and it, long. And it, it, didn't, it, it, it did not look like that in yeah. February of 1944. You know, if you were, um, if you're, you know, if you're Truscott or Mark Clark or anybody high up, you're really worried. Yeah. You're looking at maps like this and you're seeing the Germans and you're going, can we hold? You know, and it, and I, I do really think that you can say that, you know, with the 157th enormously decorated regiment, one of the greatest of World War II from the American point of view, that, you know, they, a battalion from the 157th, I believe, and the presidential unit citation for uh, the uh, actions during Operation Fishfang, that, you know, it does sometimes wars, uh, sorry, battles do come down to, you know, a, a battalion or a company or a regiment. Yeah. Just being given orders to hold, and then being almost destroyed. Yeah, you know? uh, absolutely, so, and and not over in forty-eight hours. You know, as you yeah. made the point, this is January, February, March, April. It doesn't really break till May. People talk about the Allies being slow in Normandy. Oh, you know, it took two months to get out. Well, the Anzio beachhead is more or less stuck like this for 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 three or four months, and yeah. and. You know, while you were talking about the, the 45th over there, we'll have got to put the map up now because Brad, who's watching, is going to be doing the first special service force late uh, on Wednesday. And then we've got the third division over the side. And we've got and the, the British are being hammered over to the left as well. Yeah. The Germans are maintaining this across that that yeah, entire the, front there. Yeah. And, and you've got to remember, while all this is going on, this like I, I, I it'd be interesting to, to work out what was the longest period of stalemate attrition of any one battle um in western europe in world war ii and i think that anzio you could make you could make an argument that it was anzio you know the longest time going nowhere um i can't think of another one off the top yeah. of my head that comes close um, well, what's incredible is that you look at that picture and then you know this is this is anzio then you then you think what the hell is going on in monte casino yeah we're, we're, which is which same we're, at the same time yeah no yeah. that one later on. so no, well, we've, we've tackled the, the 45th there. Let's move over to the third, because you want to talk about Morris Britt, and there's other heroes that you've talked yeah. about before, but they're over uh, to, to the east there. So their situation is similar but different, isn't it, I suppose? Well, yeah, and I think that, you know, I, mean, I was back there in October, and you look at Cisterno, I mean, that's probably one of the most bombed places in Europe. It was, I, I was there. I, I, it was a miracle that they'd been able to rebuild that, re rebuild that town. What's critical from the third ID point of view uh, and thank you for bringing on, us on to the, the Marne men, as they were known, is that Cisterna was was the key 
to success for them in terms of the entire Anzio campaign. They fought over it several times. Eventually, Cisterna is taken during the breakout. It's the main objective. We you know uh, trust Scott, who becomes um, the overall commander of, uh, of um, US forces at Anzio. He knows that when we try and break out finally and get to Rome in uh, late May of 1944, that unless he takes Cisterna and you can see the key road junctions, et cetera, Cisterna is the way to Rome. So you've got the Via Anziate, obviously, we, we pushed as much as we could up there, but the key to breaking out and hitting Rome finally is Cisterna. And that was where you had an, you know extreme violence. And uh, um, I might add this um, before we talk about uh, Maurice Britt and other individuals, that the third ID, I think it's on the 26th of May, I might be wrong, you can uh, fact check me, but on the 26th of May, I believe, um, on one day, in the, in the attempt to break out from the circle of iron around the Allies at, at Anzio, the 3rd Infantry Division set one of its many records in World War II, which is 995 casualties in one day to break out and that's all around and that was to take cisterna mm. so you had ss you had germans just hiding in the rubble they, you know keep coming at us in uh, i think over on one day alone the third id received uh, three medals of honor audie murphy was part of the operations to to try and take cisterna at the end um and it had to be taken um uh, so um 995 us soldiers casualties in one day and I'm think I'm thinking like you know Omaha Beach is or what is two thousand yeah. more than two thousand. Yeah. So, but that's the 29th, the Rangers I, and the and the yeah. first. Yeah, this yeah, is yeah. one division in a battle that most people have forgotten or don't know about in a campaign, the Italian campaign that is called the Forgotten Campaign, nine hundred ninety-five, and that's just on one day. Um, that's an example of the ferocity of the fighting there. Um, no, definitely. I think, you know, a lot of the viewers watching this, Cisterna will be familiar with them, but it doesn't yeah. roll off the tongue of your average kind of generalist World War II buff like Baston or Arnhem or Midway. It's it, it sort of, it shouldn't be in the second tier or second division no. of place names, but, but it absolutely, no. it, it probably is. People, it doesn't, it doesn't come into, as indeed, if you ask Ameri most Americans on the street, yeah. name famous units from World War II, they do 101st, 82nd Airborne, a uh, big red one, maybe. I don't think the third and the 45th would be in people's first tier. And yet, as you yeah. made the point, in terms of medals, the third division is, 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 yeah, 10%. I mean, crazy, crazy numbers. Yeah, I mean, I you could you can tell me better than this. Uh, you could you could uh, put me right here, Paul, which is like, so we look at Cisterna, yeah? Yeah. That's like, that's been fought over for almost, you know, four months, yeah? Bastogne is cut off. I think it's on the on the twenty second of December, nineteen forty four. Uh, Bastogne is actually surrounded. Whatever the screaming eagles want to talk about, like we were never, you know, we never needed to be relieved. Yeah, BS. Yeah, yeah. You needed to be relieved so badly. Cause just go and look at the communication between your division, you know, uh, McAuliffe and and uh, and others. They were begging to be saved. Sorry, lots of people are going to like, you know. Uh, <laughs> the, the 101st fanboys will be will be I'm putting not, you on the list. Bit, who can't be a fanboy? But let's get it in perspective. So you know, you only got two medals of honor, third ID that most people never heard about. 40, 20 times yeah. as many. Bastogne cut off, surrounded on the 22nd of December, relieved on the 26th of December. No, yeah. I know it was a fragile corridor, but that's four days. So four days, and then we have here const almost constant shelling and, and and a combat that stretched for four months um so i would like to see a movie called cisterna uh because we've, we've heard endlessly about bastogne but um yeah it was it was uh very intense indeed you know um there's a really great photograph i came across uh it's in my book against all odds which is like you know we were trying to we were trying to think of ideas that you, americans were trying to think of ideas how they could minimize the casualties this fits into the broader, more humane way that they tried to wage war, which was to, to minimize casualties. Um, that, hence the importance of bombing, of um, massive artillery support, etc. cetera. Um, this is a, uh, as with the Brits, this is not, these are forces that come from democracies. They, they you know, they're, they're not 
it's hard to get these young kids to kill people. Um, and, uh, well, that Americans in particular had a hell of a time. Um, so, you know, I really think that um, Sisterna goes to the heart and the Anzio battle in, uh, more broadly goes to the heart of our, our, the differences in cultures of the two, of the Germans and the allied forces. Um, so the Germans would not think of getting to my point of not putting a bunch of infantrymen in sleds and then dragging the sleds towards the front line so that they were below the below the machine below machine gun fire. And there's pictures that pictures that came across where they've got third ID guys, Marne men, who are lying in these sleds that are going to be pulled by dozers towards the German front line when they try and break out. And the point being is that you know if they can they maybe have some protection from the sleds. Didn't work. You still had 995 guys from the third ID, you know, taken out in 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 one day. So many of them cut down in those hay fields because it was, you know, it's May. There's, you know, hay fields everywhere that, you know, the medics couldn't get to them. They're just lying everywhere. You know, they were, didn't have enough medics to treat all those guys. Many of them bled out because they couldn't. We couldn't get medics to them. Um, but we tried to minimize casualties. We tried to put them in sleds. We tried to stop the slaughter, but um unfortunately not um but i think that what's interesting about anzio too um and particularly coming back to this battle around cisterna is that you know the reason why um the 40 the third infantry division received 40 medals of honor that's out of 572 which were awarded you know um about half of them posthumously in world war ii the reason why on one one day you get three guys receiving the medal of honor from the third id during the breakout is because it took us to attack and take the German positions. You had to get up out of a foxhole or a defensive position and run across open ground, hopefully under supporting fire, but you had to actually risk your neck and take the enemy positions. And that's why you had such high casualties, you know? Yeah, and we come back to that a lot on this channel is that it's all very well having this air power superiority. We've yeah. got ultra and we've got... Yeah. The but at some point, as you said there, some poor son of a bitch has to run towards enemy and occupy that village, occupy that town yeah. and winkle that enemy out at bayonet point through house, through cellar, through basement. And that's exactly what those guys did there. And it's about time we bought, we, we mentioned Morris Britt because possibly overshadowed by Audie Murphy, not that there's anyone would, would you yeah. know, be, be grateful standing in the shadows figuratively because he was quite short of idiot Audie Murphy. But <laughs> as you made the point and again, so there are, there there are so many incredible, incredible, you know, combat leaders, examples of brilliant combat ability. And and Morris Britt is is going to be up there in 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 one of the most incredible soldiers of World War Two. You know, again, the fanboys. You've got your Dick Winters there, your hundred first guys. But Morris Britt is got. Tell tell us about Morris. Um, well, actually, just um, I've actually um, just. Uh um wrote an essay i, I you know I, I think i may have told you before but i work for uh, an organization called friends of the world war ii memorial it's yep. like literally about a mile down there um in dc where i am here and um i write an essay every month and today we i, I it was published on our website i think i retweeted it earlier yeah i did yeah. i retweeted it yeah about morris brick because you know he landed today um with uh, as a uh, with uh, as l company commander in the 30th infantry regiment and um, had his arm blown off at, at Anzio. Um, so he, he arrived, you know, he's from Arkansas. Um, it's a hell of a, a hell of a character. That, the reason why he's holding the football there, it's a great picture, thank you, Paul, is because um, he was in the Detroit, he played for the Detroit Lions. Um, so an NFL player, um, you know, grew up in complete poverty in Arkansas. His father died when I think when he was like 12 years old. So he's one of those, you know, countless yanks that actually had to go and learn how to hunt and shoot to put food on the table um got a scholarship to the university of arkansas uh, was a star athlete not just in football um played at the razorback stadium that's actually taken at the razorback stadium at the university of arkansas it's the day that he received the medal of honor you'll notice his arms missing here um <coughs> and that's actually received that on the 5th of june 1944 just you know literally as the Glamour Boys, 101st Airborne, are blacking up their faces <laughs> about in the war. He's in Arkansas receiving uh, receiving the Medal of Honor, um, which is a big deal, you know, in front of the home crowd that he played in front of as a student. Um, anyway, he uh, was at the University of Arkansas uh, when he played, I think it was the 
the last season he played was 1941 season uh, with the NFL. Um, nicknamed Footsie Brit. Uh, he was so, people. <clears throat> it's interesting because I say, like, where does he get his nickname from? And so people, I came across these references to how big his feet were. I'm like, well, how big were they? I mean, I I wear a pair, pair size 13. And what size are you, Paul? Um, I'm a, I'm 11. Are you? I, you're. I'm surprised by that actually for a, a tall guy like you. But anyway, um, point is that he only had size 13 feet, but they called him nicknamed him Footsy Brit. So there must have been an awful lot of like guys with very small feet. To... I, I think one of my bits of trivia is it was I think six was the average size in World War Two. I you're feel that's in my head in Americans. You're joking. I feel. I mean, oh, uh, yeah. Omaha Beach. The average guy was five foot seven, 28 and 38, th or 28 or 30 inch waist, and 100. 60 or something. I, I had that figure, man. I'm, I'm fairly certain that six or seven was the average foot size. Yeah, a bunch of bloody midgets. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's how they could fit them in the landing craft. That's why. Yeah, 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 right. That's how we won in the end. Numbers. <laughs> but anyway, so uh, he's he's um, size 30 feet, whatever. But anyway, so he his first amphibious uh, um, invasion is Operation Torch. Yeah. November 1942. Um, he was actually part of the guard for um, the Casablanca conference um, there that planned Sicily and Italy, certainly initially Sicily, uh, fought across Sicily, um, company commander, landed at Salerno, um, and then fought, received the Medal of Honor for actions, I believe on the, I think it's the 8th of November, 1943 for, at Mount Rotundo. I was just there like uh, two months ago. And that's south of Monte Cassino. You can, from Mount Rotundo, you can see Mount Rotundo from, I think you can see it from Monte Cassino. It's the winter line, Gustav line, whatever you want to call it. Um, and, is a, you know, so uh, what's amazing about this guy is that um, we can talk a bit more about how he lost his arm at Anzio. But um, imagine this. In December 1944, I found a photograph. I think you may have it. Um, December 1944, he received the DSC in New York. So arms blown off, February 1944, comes back to the States, um, goes on bond tours, is a big deal, is a you know, good-looking former professional athlete. And in December 1944, it, he receives a DSC, which makes him the first American to receive every single medal for valor in World War II that you could receive. So they didn't hand out the Bronze Star in World War I, but, and they, but they did in World War II. So... He's got the Bronze Star, Silver Star, DSC, and the Medal of Honor, full set. First American to to get that, to 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 you know, to bag all of them, if you like, which makes him a big deal. I mean, this is a superstar, you know. Um, so when he came back from the European theatre, when he arrived back in the U.S. Uh, without his arm, um, there were two generals that, that 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 met him when he got off the boat, and they'd both been sent by George Marshall. So that they. It, the U.S. military knew what they had here. They had a, they had a, a remarkable character and, and warrior, um, and he kept that record. He kept the record of being the most, you know, having every medal you could get. The first, he kept that until March of 1945, when a guy from his own division, not his regiment, the 15th Infantry Regiment, a I think he was five foot, I think Audie Murphy was five foot seven, when Audie Murphy. Uh, received news that he was going to be awarded the Medal of Honor. That was like, I think it was in March 1945 that he found out for sure that he was going to get the Medal of Honor, which meant that, as the third ID newspaper, newspaper said, that they were both equal to each other's record. They treated the third ID newspaper, the front line it was called, treated Brit and Murphy as if they were sports stars. They were yeah. vying yeah. for the most medals. You know, it was like this crazy, you know, made-up competition that they were racking up points because he did actually rack up points for medals although interestingly without getting too diverted um the bronze star was worth exactly the same as a medal of honor in the point system so you, know, you could have you could receive the medal of honor and you weren't going to go home any faster than the guy who just got a low you know a bronze star um, now that is interesting yeah i've never checked yeah that is that's kind of a bum deal if, if you ask me that's a really bum deal I'm like, i just checked by the way size nine was the average i was too <laughs> small on my on my size but an audi murphy was five foot five so he was a bit small but it was not oh, okay. nine, 
Nine was the most issued boot apparently in World War Two. Oh, but, okay. um, but maybe you were having double pairs of socks I'm, anyway, whatever. But I'm talking to the wrong guy here when it comes to things like giving people's heights and stuff. Obviously, you know, because ah, um, uh, yeah, I'm, clearly I'm not a, I'm not an expert yeah. on that. But I, I want to bring it back before we kind of wind things up because your your new book is 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 about pattern and 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 yeah. the, the prayer and things like that. And you know, you're not necessarily an operational historian. You're more of a no. people historian. So. I know we've talked about it before, but for those who perhaps haven't seen you before, how do you approach when you're writing about, for example, the Italian campaign? How 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 much of the military detail and the maps and things do you put in, and how much of the person person? How do you balance it? Well, I think if you have to keep looking at a map when you're reading a book, especially when you've paid, you know, twenty five quid or or thirty two bucks, which my new book's going to cost in the US. I think if you have to keep referring to the maps, it's like you, you're probably not going to get a, a very large readership, you know. Um, but they're really important. And I think that goes to your point about, you know, how do you craft a compelling narrative, especially in this very tight space, which is called World War II, which has been written about probably more than anything else, you know. Um, you know, how many books are going to come out on the 80th anniversary of D-Day this year? How many did come out on the 75th when I had my book, The First Wave, come out? So I... I've been, I think I've been very lucky because I've always taken the approach that I'm a journalist, you know, I'm not mm. an academic, don't want to be, um, I didn't set out to be uh, a military historian. I, I was always interested in human stories. So The Bedford Boy is my first real book about World War II. It's like came out in 2003, you know, which I think I'm probably best known for, maybe, I don't know. Anyway, that was just a whole bunch of interviews. Guys were still around, you know. It was I did it. I researched it in 2000, 2001, uh, two, and uh, I, I think I did like 40, 50 interviews. So to me, writing about World War II was just an extension of being a journalist. I was like, okay, yeah. you know, lots of people are into World War II. I'm into World War II. I'm I'm a super World War II nerd. Always have been. I had I all airfix sets. I had all the soldiers and stuff like that. And um, you know, remember watching the World at War with my dad. You know. Um, Du, 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 you know the Thames TV theme music, etc. I'm like, I'm like all your viewers. You know, we're like, yeah, that, that's that. You, that's, you feel that that's the demographic. That there's yeah, a yeah, so exception, I, but that's, I, I that's the one, demographic. I think one of the things that everybody, you know, everybody knows that you're, that you know, better than almost anybody. But and all the people that watch this fab show, I think the one thing that we share is that we we love the history, and it's about it's about our childhoods. It's about nostalgia and sentimentality a lot for us it's about looking back on our own lives now as we're in our middle ages and you know thinking like wow it's like I, I, that that was something to be i loved watching the movies i loved reading the longest day i loved uh, you know for me um you know the great escape uh fantastic movie you know the douglas bardo i mean i'm trying, trying to think of the uh, the um the author of those books now oh what's his name uh, paul brickhill yeah, so to me, so to me, the def very definition of great narrative World War II history is Paul Brickhill. I, I, you know, Beevor, great, Hastings, great, James Holland, fantastic, whatever. But I'm not going to on a desert island take even my books there. I'm going to be reading Paul Brickhill, The Great Escape, Dan Buster's um, Reach the Sky, 200 pages, brilliantly told. Uh, Longest Day is another example of this, where it's narrative history. You've got these, this incredible, these incredible events. And they're just told as stories. So I think that um, you got to you got to think story first. You've yeah. Well, when, I, when, I, when I first met you, I told you how many people I've recommended Bedford Boys to because it's it's a human interest book that happens to include Omaha Beach. Whereas, for example, yeah. Joe Balkowski's book on Omaha Beach is a battle yeah. study of Omaha Beach. And yeah. the amount of people who emailed back and said, "Yeah, I've tried other books, but they, they just got too bogged down in which type of tank it was." Yeah. And H company kicking off at a certain and Bedford boys is you know that we're going off on a tangent talking about the Stevens twins and the, and all it, it is about people and that's why yeah, people no, joined it. Course. Colin, who you've been to the beer, beer with, he he still thinks Longest Winter is your is your best work, Alex. So uh, <laughs> I can't disagree. Well, I, Another classic. I, I, I think I owe Colin a few beers by now, don't I? I don't know whether I paid him back properly for the um, probably not. But, but, but be careful getting involved in an owing Colin beers thing because that's <laughs> that's a debt that you might find yourself struggling ah, to pay off. I'm going to lose that one. Yeah, I'm going to lose. Yeah, that he one. was he was around mine last night drinking my beer from England that I just brought back. But no, um, we we but the pat. Tell us a little bit about the as a teaser about the pattern book and which angle you're coming from, and uh, and well, then then we'll call it a day. 
Yeah, well, I, you know, they, I think people who know about patent, that you know, that there's the famous patents prayer, which is like patent calls in the chief chaplain of the Third Army. Um, I think it was like the 8th of, this, of uh, December 1944. He's just been through the, uh, the rain campaign, terrible uh, campaign of attrition. He's really dispirited. The Third Army's had their hell kicked out of it, especially the Fourth Armoured. And he's like, you know, uh, the problem here is the weather. I mean, it was much more than the weather. It was like the fact that they actually... Uh, the, the entire strategy of the, uh, the Lorraine campaign was kind of ill-advised. And so he, he calls in the chief chaplain, and um, I think there were over 25 denominations within the Third Army, and he says to the chaplain, he's in Nancy, the Third Army headquarters, he said, like, chaplain, go away and come up with a prayer for good weather. And uh, the chaplain does, comes back that very same day. And you can find online, if you Google Patton's prayer, you can actually see the prayer card. Yeah. And it's a prayer for good weather and victory, et cetera, et cetera. But the, here's the thing. Uh, every single guy in the Third Army was issued one, a prayer card. 200, they printed 250,000 prayer cards and distributed them. And the last of them were distributed on guess what day? The 14th of December, 1944. Two days later, you have the Battle of the Bulge. And the Battle of the Bulge, I believe, are, that, that's the battle in which Patton was at his very finest. You know, um, so my book is really about the fact that the prayer was answered by the fortitude, tenacity and courage and resilience of American troops during the Battle of the Bulge, which does include, by the way, the 101st Airborne. I've I got yep. a lot of them. Yeah, them. Yep. they were awesome. Um, but um, the skies cleared on the 22nd of December 1944, which allowed us to bring in our big, big seat big powerful weapon which was called you know a p-47 mustang sh rattle mm -hmm. machine guns and chewing up everything in its sight and and uh and uh, air power so Patton was there in in uh, luxembourg city on the 22nd he looks out of his office sees the blue skies wrote writes in his diary great day for Ger killing germans the skies have cleared my prayer has been answered. He really believed that, you know. Um, he was well, that's the interesting crazy. aspect of his personality, isn't it? The the, yeah. the his spiritual side, his side, yeah. his you know. And we and we can talk about that when the book is out because yeah. I'm intrigued to know. We'll we'll leave it for the next time. You know, whether your research, whether you went into right researching pattern with one opinion and came out with it. I mean, mine keeps yeah. changing every yeah. time. I think he's great. I read something and I go, yeah, I think he's awful again, and then I go back. No, he's, no, no, it's no. so complicated. This is, this, 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 you know, great and awful, uh, what you should think about is who got the job done, you know? Yeah. He got the job done. Um, and the, cha the chaplain, without going on too long, I'm just going to add this in because the chaplain that had created the prayer is the only guy I know of, a chaplain in World War II, that got a medal for writing a prayer. His pattern called him yeah, back. Yeah, true. So. Remember that. Yeah. Thanks a lot. But, um, well, we'll talk about that next time, Alex. Yeah. It's been great talking to you, and uh, we'll meet up again in due course at some point, as I hope. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Nothing tomorrow. Then we're carrying on our Anzio week on Wednesday. Lots more shows coming your way. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, viewers. I'm off to watch Leicester Ipswich. Cheers, everybody. Bye. Yeah, cheers, mate. Great show. Thanks a lot, man. Bye.